The last thing I'm trying to do on this podcast is make generalizations about moms. But I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that sitting on the floor with an action figure in your hand, doing your best Batman or Barbie impression, is not your favorite way to play with your kids. And I'll take a flying leap to another limb and guess that you feel at least a little bit guilty about that. If this is true, you're not alone. It's not my favorite thing either. Nor Brittany's. I do not enjoy playing ponies and LOL dolls and things where like you have to make the little figure walk around and talk about stuff. Like I, I, I don't enjoy it and I'm not good at it and it makes me grouchy. Nor Joy's. I'm not that person. I'm not the sit down and play with dolls forever type of mom. I'm not. I'm more of the, I birthed you all, so go and play together. <laughs> and I'll provide opportunities and experiences for you. Nor even Rachel's. I think that I initially thought that a good mom should play on the floor and do that. But then I think sometimes I was resentful while I was playing because I didn't want to do it, but I thought that a good mom should. If playing on the floor with your kids is your favorite thing, you're a beautiful unicorn and you should own it. If it's not, maybe it's time to drop the guilt and embrace the unique ways you do like playing with your kids. This is the How She Moms podcast with Whitney Archibald. I'm a mother of five on a mission to help moms connect with your kids, manage your homes, and create your own unique version of motherhood. I curate ideas from different moms so you can pick and choose what works for you and your family. I chose this topic because I thought it would be fun as we all head into the holiday season to find out different ways moms play with their kids. But I wasn't prepared for the strong emotions and opinions I would encounter as I asked moms this question. And the strongest emotion I encountered was guilt. I found myself in a figurative confessional booth as moms revealed the things they don't like to play with their kids. I'm looking at you, Candyland, Shoots and Ladders, and Hi-Ho Cherio and how they felt bad about not enjoying them. But as soon as I asked a few questions, I invariably discovered dozens of ways each of these moms were great at playing with their kids, sometimes without even thinking of these things as play. In this episode, we're going to talk about 10 tactics to bring a little more play into parenting. Along the way, we'll dig into the guilt a little bit and examine the pressure we feel to entertain our kids. We'll talk to moms about specific ways they play with their kids, including March Madness-style taste tests, airborne pancakes, and competitive toilet wiping, and we'll even learn some techniques for making those pretend play sessions something you can actually enjoy once in a while. Playing with kids is one of those rare practices that is both fun and really good for both you and your kids. A journal article from 2018 entitled The Power of Play, A Pediatric Role in Enhancing Development in Young Children from the American Academy of Pediatrics positions play as one of the biggest safeguards against the current epidemic of toxic stress that kids are facing right now. And that was before the pandemic. The article says, play is not frivolous. It enhances brain structure and function and promotes executive function, the process of learning rather than the content, which allow us to pursue goals and ignore distractions. Furthermore, play supports the formation of the safe, stable, and nurturing relationships with all caregivers that children need to thrive. So wait a minute, I'm supposed to be alleviating your guilt about playing with your kids, not adding to it. And now I'm telling you, you're going to stress your kids out and stunt their brain development if you don't drop everything to play with them for hours on end? Actually, no. Because when you're playing with kids, a little focus play actually goes a long way. The first tactic we're going to talk about is to set aside deliberate time for play, even if it's just 10 minutes here and there. One of the family fun gurus that I most look up to is Maria Eckersley, a mom of six kids ranging in age from 7 to 21. She runs the website mechmom.com with the tagline, Posts and Products to Help You Be the Fun Mom. And she's not kidding. Her website is full of brilliant printables, courses, and ideas to incorporate fun into motherhood. I'm currently enrolled in her year-long course for teaching the Book of Mormon to kids, and it's full of fun and easy ideas and object lessons. In fact, I outsource quite a lot of my fun to her on a weekly basis. Here's Maria. I think because we had so many kids so quickly, I really didn't have the option to be the hands-on, you know, like sit with my child for hours at a time kind of mom. I, I would give them, what I would try to do is condense my time into like quality good time that was a small chunk rather than kind of give them little bits of me throughout the day. So we would take, we did things like um, in the summertime, we do something we call Couch Potato Book Club, which is this 
where we will read a chapter of a book at night and we always read in some weird location, you know, and it's just something we do as like a secret club between us. And that means the rest of the day, I haven't read with any of them and I haven't been able to like sit in a quiet, cozy spot with them. But at the end of the day, at the night, in the night, we'll get pajamas on, like sit in the laundry room, or sometimes we go out on the hammocks and deck and we'll find a different spot each night. In fact, that's part of the book club is you have to pick a different spot every night to read. And I found that those little packets of solid mothering time would kind of replenish me enough to make me not feel guilty about the other things I didn't accomplish in the day. It seems to be like now I can, I have the benefit of seeing my older kids mature and those are the pieces of the day they remember. They have no memories of me doing dishes or ignoring their playtime when I'm, you know, vacuuming or whatever, but they have memories of you know, cuddling up with me in the laundry room to read a book. So I feel like you just kind of have to put your energy into what will last and all the little stuff you just have to kind of let slide. I love that. I noticed that you, you used the word replenish, re- replenish yourself. And I don't know that a lot of moms think of their playtime with their kids as replenishing them. Maybe they think of that as their time to give, but how can you make it work for both? It's a mental thing I have to push myself to do every single time because I feel like My natural state and desire is, I mean, every time it would be time for Couch Potato Book Club, my brain would be like, I don't have time today. I'm too tired today. It's it's your natural inclination to want to preserve your energy and your time. And I feel like what I've found is if I will just push myself over that hump and say, okay, I'm just going to give it five minutes. I'm just going to give it 10 minutes. What I've learned is that it's like planting this seed and it will like swell up. And I just, I have to reteach myself that every single time. And that's like, that's where the replenishment comes in is every time when we end Couch Potato Book Club, I have never closed the book and said, well, that was a waste of 10 minutes. Like not one time, because every time I feel like, okay, that was worth it. Look how happy they are. I feel so much better about my ability to mother It was so refreshing to hear that even someone I look up to as the pinnacle of the fun mom is not on stage all the time. And I love the idea of the Couch Potato Book Club. They even have their own secret chant as part of the club. The kids never know where the location will be until Maria announces it that night. Then they bring flashlights and cozy blankets and snuggle in to read. They call it the Couch Potato Book Club because they have another rule that, as a member of the club, if you're reading on the couch during the day, you have immunity from chores during that reading session. Until you get up off the couch, that is. The second tactic we're going to talk about is to be fully present when you play. I was lucky enough to meet a lifelong mom mentor, Jana Free, when I was a really young mom in Minnesota. Every year on the 4th of July, they held a free-for-all, an open invitation family picnic in their backyard with a giant slip and slide and all sorts of old-fashioned family games. What I remember most about the party is a moment when the adults were doing that very adult thing where we just gathered under a tree and talked while the kids played with each other. Jana got on her megaphone and announced, This is a family party, which means it's time for all you adults to come join in the fun. And she started passing out potato sacks for the next race. It was such a good reminder to get right in and play. Both Jana and her husband, Scott, are so good at it. Don't stand on the sidelines. You know, if Scott and I go to a youth dance, we dance. And, you know, yeah, people may think we're crazy, but we have a great time. And, And we play with the kids. You know, if we're at the park together, we're playing a game with the kids, right? We we came up with this game called Dungeons and Dwarves. And, (laughs) you know, we we play this game with the kids at the park. We're swinging on the swings. We're on the equipment. And, you know, that's not to say that we might not sit down or whatever. But, you know, when when we're places with the kids, we're, we're participating. Rachel Nielsen, the amazing mom behind the 3 and 30 podcast, also brought up this idea of being fully present when I asked her about when she truly has fun with her children. The specific times when I can think of have been when I have leaned into being really present. And so I can think of a time when I took them to the hot springs nearby and I just put all to-dos out of my mind. I just was with them in the water, enjoying them and the sun was shining, and I just thought this is such a beautiful, perfect moment. And being a mom who works, I feel like my mind is often on a lot of other things when I'm with my kids, but I've noticed that 
when I lean into being present, I have so much more fun. And that's true even for distance learning. I, at the beginning of the school year, was really resisting. I wanted them to do more of it on their own. And I wanted to be able to get work done. And it was no fun for any of us. But since I started leaning in and kind of enjoying it and saying, I'm going to enjoy this time with them, teaching them and being with them, we all just love it so much more. So I've pretty much said, I will not do any work at all in the mornings. I'm just going to help my kids do distance learning. And then I'll work in the afternoons. And it just makes it way more enjoyable. Those moments when you can drop everything and focus on play are wonderful. But you can also incorporate play into everyday interactions with your kids. That certainly counts too. This brings us to tactic three, incorporate fun into your family culture. And again, Maria Eckersley is a great example of this. There are a lot of roles in a family. You know, it's a place of learning. It's a place of helping each other and all sorts of good things. But I feel like the fun element can kind of seep into all of those other ones. And it just, I don't know, for our family, I feel like it created a kind of identity. Just like some families are known for being amazing golfers or, you know, loving boating or whatever our family is kind of centered around fun but like easy lazy fun (laughs) so I think it's helped kind of connect us we've had lots and lots of hard things just like every other family and I feel like having that thread of fun that weaves through all of our trials has helped us kind of I don't know stay afloat during the hard parts and give us kind of purpose behind things. So I really feel like the value of play and the value of fun is you really can't measure it. It it reaps rewards for a long, long time. Because most of the time when I'm a fun mom, it's not because I planned it that way. Like it's in little things. For example, when we every time we have pancakes, we have a tradition that I will never let the kids take a pancake off the griddle. They have to catch it. So I will take my spatula and I will toss it behind the back and the pancakes fly across the kitchen and they have to catch it. And it's just become a thing in our family, you know? So they will, you know, we'll laugh every single time we have pancakes. And normally that would be one of those things where it's like, oh, it's a pancake dinner. I'm such a lame mom tonight, you know? Right. My kids love that piece of it. And because we've added this element of fun in, then I don't feel guilty about making pancakes for dinner. We can do it anytime we want. And I feel like a good mom because we're laughing in the kitchen and I, you know, so I feel like creating fun moments is a way to kind of neutralize whatever guilty feelings you have about being imperfect. I think you just, it just gives you like the freedom to enjoy your imperfection a little bit differently. Oh, my kids are going to love it when I try the pancake thing. Playing with your kids is about connection, strengthening relationships and getting to know them better. It's important enough that the book, The Whole Brain Child, designated family fun as one of its 12 whole brain strategies. It talks about how having fun with your kids releases dopamine in all your brains, reinforcing those positive family relationships. It says, What this means is that when your son squeals in delight when you dramatically die from his Peter Pan sword thrust, when you and your daughter dance together at a concert in the living room, or when you and your kids work together on a gardening or construction project, the experience strengthens the bonds between you and teaches your kids that relationships are affirming, rewarding, and fulfilling. Part of building these connections is just to consciously show our kids that we like them and enjoy being with them. Here's Rachel Nielsen again. I just think about like if I was around an adult, my husband or a friend or my boss or a colleague that just constantly harped on me all the time that I just knew didn't really like me, how degrading that feels and how, you know, it's just all day long, every interaction is just like, they don't like me. They're annoyed, you know, versus being working with somebody that, you know, enjoys you. And it's mostly positive the way that they talk to you. And I think about that with my kids sometimes when I get in a real naggy, you know, phase where I'm like, gosh, it must be so hard to be around me. That must just grate on their self-esteem if they don't have a sense that I really enjoy them. I mean, and of course we have moments where we get mad at each other or anything else, but I hope that the overarching feeling that my kids get is that I really enjoy their company because I do. I really enjoy being with them. Um, I feel like I learned this from my father, this idea that you can be playful even if you don't have excess or a lot of time to play. My dad was extremely, extremely busy growing up. He was very busy at work. He's an attorney and just worked, I mean, so much. And then he also was busy with church work. 
And so he wasn't around a lot, but when he was around, he was playful. And I just knew how much he loved us and how much he enjoyed us in the ways that he interacted with us. So, and he had these little traditions with us that he built in that became almost rituals where like he would come home from work and we knew that after he changed his clothes, we would play boom and he would throw us on the bed. And he has nicknames for everyone still. He had nicknames with us as as kids and now he has nicknames for our kids and it's kind of they call him bapa it's a bapa thing that everybody has kind of a silly nickname and it makes it playful and we laugh about it because of the way that he interacts it's just so obvious that he enjoys us we it i never felt like i was an annoyance or anything else even though it was rare for him to have the time to really be like playing with me I just knew he really loved and enjoyed me. But remember, there's no room for guilt here. Just because these moms are good at building fun into everyday life doesn't mean every moment is fun, even at their houses. I invited Joy Chantry to be part of this episode specifically because I follow her Instagram account called Joy's Fun Stuff. As you might imagine, she comes up with some really fun stuff to do with your kids. But even she, Joy of Joy's Fun Stuff, did not feel qualified to talk about playing with kids. Well, when you, when you sent me that email, I told you my husband and I just, I read it to my husband. We both started laughing. Like, I think it's really important though, because I think sometimes we get in our minds that we're supposed to be like that all the time. Yeah. And there's no way you can maintain because we all have times where we don't feel good or we're tired or we're stressed or we're frustrated or we're overwhelmed. And I think, I think we can also put this big weight on us that if we're not doing a taste test challenge tonight, like this girl on Instagram did, you know, with M&Ms or whatever, then we're not a fun mom. And, and it's, you know, what's the point, but I think we just need to understand, like, nobody's like that all the time. I mean, maybe they are, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's people out there that are just playful and happy and doing silly things all day long. And they're always steady, but I am not, I'm, I've got good ups and downs. And I think we just need to embrace where we are and enjoy those times that we can bring the fun in because you know, there's going to be times when you're going to have negative interactions with your kids because they're kids and you're human. If I could give you any gift for Christmas, I'd give you the gift of knowing what's for dinner. Of all the persistent chores of taking care of a family, feeding them is perhaps the most relentless. And I've had way too many days of staring in the fridge at 6 p.m. like a zombie wondering what the heck I'm going to make. That's why I created my meal planning workshop. The goal of this workshop is to help you figure out your top priorities for feeding your family, learn about a variety of tactics that are working for other families, and then figure out a realistic system that fits your personality and your family situation. Because we all have different learning styles, there are two ways to access this course. A video workshop so you can take the course at your own pace on your own schedule, or live Zoom workshops coming in January. Each version is just $25 at HowSheMoms.com. The next tactic is a subset of fitting fun into everyday life, making work more fun. Not surprisingly, Maria Eckersley is really good at this. We definitely are not like about chores necessarily being fun. (laughs) My kids would never tell you that jobs are fun, but we do incorporate things. So for example, on our job chart, that runs our entire house, they'll have, you know, their kitchen job, their daily job, their Saturday job. None of those are fun, but they also have what we call their fun job for the week, which is one kid is the DJ for the week, which means anytime there's a fight in the car about who picks the music, the DJ is the one that gets to you know be the deciding vote. Or if we need music in the morning for while we're, you know, getting ready for school, they get to pick the music. And there's another um, job that's the movie man. And that means if we watch a family movie, they get to pick it. Or if there's a fight on the TV about what people want to watch, the movie man is the deciding vote. So I feel like they don't love the job chart and they never will love cleaning the bathrooms, but I try to make it if they're, if the hardest job, like they all hate loading the dishes at the least popular job. So I try and attach that with the same um, fun job that they all love. So things like being the movie man is the favorite spot for the week. So we put those two jobs together. So I feel like in our world, it's just a balancing act. I feel like that's, that's how as an adult, we have to function all the time. A lot of what we do, even if it's something we're passionate about and love, a lot of it we don't enjoy. So we find ways to kind of cushion that blow a little bit by doing things we like 
you know, sandwiching it in between things we do enjoy. So I feel like teaching that when they're kids is a good thing too. I think it even helps to say, what are the parts of our family dynamic that I don't enjoy? You know, and what if I, if I laundry is what I hate, then I'm going to try and focus my efforts to figure out a way to make that fun to me or fun to my family. There's got to be some cool hamper we can buy that they can shoot like a basket or there's got to be, I need something that makes this compelling for my kids so that they can, we can both enjoy it better. So I feel like that's where you want to put your effort. You want to put your energy and even money to help neutralize the things you don't like. I'm so excited about this. I can't wait to try it with my own kids. What a great idea to actually assign fun jobs. You can order an editable version of Maria's chore chart on her website. I'll include the link in my show notes. I also love Maria's perspective about neutralizing the difficult things. Joy Chantry even had a hilarious way to solve a messy bathroom problem with a bit of fun. We're having massive problems. What is it with kids and flushing toilets? Maybe, again, maybe it's just my family. No, it's, it's ours too. Ugh. So gross. Yeah. So I, I'm not big on competition between my kids. I'm really careful with it because I feel like it can pit themselves against each other. And that's not the environment that I want in my home. I'm really careful about introducing competition between them. Um, I have no problem com- competing them against themselves. You know, this is what your time yesterday. In fact, I use that all the time. Okay. You, you did this, this sheet in three minutes yesterday. Let's see if you can beat your time. Um, but I, what I typically, what I'd love to do is to put, pit them against me. And then it's funny. <laughs> we call it beat the pro. So I always put like, I'll make a chart and my name is huge and their name is tiny and their points are tiny and my points are massive. But basically the only way I get a point is if they do something they shouldn't. So in the case of the toilet flushing caper, (laughs) how to get them to flush the dang toilet, they Um, they, the only way I get a point is if they don't flush. So I would go in and be like, Oh, hooray. One point for me. And so I would, I had a piece of paper just right outside the main bathroom and you know, we'd, we'd give, we'd give ourselves points. And then I was like, you know what? And if you wipe, wipe the toilet seat, that's another one, but it can't be for yourself. You just should wipe your own toilet seat. But if you walk in and someone else hasn't wiped, you get another point. And you know, I came up with all these things that were driving me nuts in the bathroom. If you change the toilet paper roll, that's a point, right? <laughs> so it actually, it actually worked out really, really well. They, every toilet was flushed for like a month. It was, it was crazy. And I don't think they, we didn't, they didn't win anything. They just won the bragging rights, but it made a huge difference because it was like, boom in your face. I flushed the toilet. (laughs) Good job, honey. Good job. I'm so proud of you. Tactic five is to find that magical sweet spot where your idea of fun and your kid's idea of fun overlaps. Playing with your kids isn't only about them and their development. It's good for you too. The American Academy of Pediatrics article I quoted earlier goes on to talk about how play can help parents re-experience or reawaken the joy of their own childhood and rejuvenate themselves. Through play and rereading their favorite childhood books, parents learn to see the world from their child's perspectives and are likely to communicate more effectively with their child, even appreciating and sharing their child's sense of humor and individuality. My friend Celeste Davis, who runs the blog MarriageLaboratory.com and is an expert on building strong relationships, has some good thoughts about this. She suggests you think about it like a Venn diagram. A circle on one side is like what my kids like to do. And a circle on the other side is what I like to do. And I am always looking for that overlap of what we both love to do. I think that's so important because I've done special time with my kids forever. Like, I don't know, six years where we, we, I try to spend 10 minutes a day with each kid. I, I'm far, far, far from perfect in this, but I try. Anyways, and so for years, I was just like, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do, this is your time. You totally get to choose. I'm here for you. And so I spent a lot of years playing a lot of Legos, <laughs> and a lot of rescue bots, a lot of like, rah, 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 you know, whatever. And it was fun. And I'm glad I, I don't regret that at any means. But I find that I bring a whole new energy to special time when we are doing the things that we both love to do. And it's not something like, oh, I've got to do special time. Oh, I've got to play the Legos. It's like, oh, we're reading Harry Potter today. Yes. You know, it's like, oh, yay, yay. Let's have special time. Let's have time. Like, I 
am excited for it when I like to do it. And <laughs> that's a big deal, you know, that's, that brings a whole other energy. So the things that I love to do with my kids, we, all of us love cooking shows. We love MasterChef Junior. We love Nailed It. And we get crazy into it. We're like ridiculous. We're rooting. We're crying. <laughs> you know and then we like get to bake stuff afterwards sometimes too so that's really fun and then I love to read books that I love with them which is really fun to have kids get older and be able to read I'm like read I just finished the secret garden with my oh, daughter nice. which was so fun because that was a favorite of mine and Harry Potter of course and anyways and now I, a recent one is art like my daughter my seven-year-old just got um, an art set for Christmas with like acrylics and canvases and an easel and so we've been doing YouTube tutorials of like simple acrylic paintings and it's been so fun. Oh. I love it. And I've gone too far with trying to focus on just what my kids like. I've also gone too far in focusing just what I like because I want my kids to like hiking so badly and they just don't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's very sad, but I have to force them to go. And so it was just kind of making everybody miserable. And not that I can't ever take my kids on hikes, but just to, to focus on the things we both love to do has been really good for our relationship. Brittany Smart, a mom of five and the author of The Five Minute Time In, has also figured out her sweet spot. I enjoy playing games and reading and doing puzzles with my children. I do not enjoy playing ponies and LOL dolls. And so when I can give myself grace and recognize, you know what, I am happy to bring you the Barbie box to my four-year-old right now. Like, yes, let me help you get that set up for you to play. And when you want to play with me, I would love to play this game with you and, and kind of be good with that and be comfortable knowing that I'm giving my best self and no, I'm not going to win any awards in the Barbie playing mother department and, and it's okay. And I'm not a, I'm not a worse mom because of the, you know, the things that I'm not interested in. And Joy has found her sweet spot too. Well, I'm a really, I like to create. That's, I love to create. When I taught school, uh, my favorite parts of, <laughs> my favorite parts of, of teaching where I would do a holiday and we'd shut down the classroom for two days because I was the music teacher. And so it would just be crazy. I would go all out, all in. And so that transfers into my, you know, when I started having kids that, that was like so fun for me to do the holidays and the birthdays, just, just ridiculous. Um, and so they, of course they love that because it's, you know, who, who wouldn't love to have all those fun, weird things. Um, but I love creating it. So that's, that's how it's fun for me. The back to school day, like I did a, a rest in peace summer party. So while the kids were at school, I decorated, I pulled like all the summer stuff out like goggles and swim shoes or whatever. But then I also went up and pulled out all the Halloween stuff. And so I decorated like black with candles, like all over in one room. Like basically that's what I do is I decorate typically the one room because it's too much to do the whole house. Yeah. And then just transform that room into a different place so that you walk in. And anyway, we all wore black. And when my husband, cause the kids came home and they all saw it and were dying. And then when my husband came home, we were all, we were all wearing black and we met him at the door with his black suit jacket and made him put it on. And he's like, what is going on? And he walked in, <laughs> he was dying. <laughs> no, that was a good one. This is so fascinating to me because holiday celebrations and decorations and things like that are actually really intimidating to me. They are not my comfort zone or my idea of fun. But I love the fact that that's the sweet spot for some moms. It's so amazing what unique things we all bring to the table. The great thing about figuring out your own play specialties is that it also helps you identify the specialties of others whom you can use to fill in the gaps, which is tactic six. The first set of specialists you can turn to are other kids. I've already established that I don't love playing action figures. However, watching and listening to my kids play action figures together on the floor is one of my very favorite things in the whole world. 
They come up with the most hilarious voices, conversations, and scenarios. In fact, I'm almost out of that stage completely, so when I catch them doing it, I pause whatever I'm doing to eavesdrop. Other kids are experts at pretend play, a great reason to set up play dates and play groups. It's fine to let them be the experts and run with it. In fact, you may be getting in the way of their play if you're constantly trying to orchestrate it. In her book, The Gift of Failure, Jessica Leahy says, The most important lessons of play and friend time are interpersonal, and these lessons are best learned when uninterrupted and free of adult manipulations and machinations. Adults should give kids the space and freedom to learn this language and work out the tough social moments for themselves, because those fights, tussles, and silent treatments and breakups are, despite the tears and heartbreak they cause, invaluable opportunities for growth. Other adults are another great resource to fill in your gaps in expertise. Figure out what kinds of play you, your spouse, and other caregivers specialize in, make time for it, and embrace your differences. Here's Rachel Nielsen again. I sort of think the way my husband plays with them is playing, because he like jumps on the tramp with them and does things like that, and I discount the way that I play with them, because I don't jump on the tramp with them and do other things, Uh but what I do totally counts too. I think even in their minds, they... They also don't really ask me to jump on the tramp and do things like that because they know that's not my style of playing. Right. And so they ask me to snuggle them and read to them and do all these things that they know fit me and my strengths. And then they ask my husband to do the other kind of play. Although it might sound counterintuitive, one of the best ways we can encourage and teach our kids to play is to step back and let them entertain themselves. A few years ago, we moved to a magical cul-de-sac that's a total throwback to the 50s. My youngest son gets to be part of a pack of seven boys between the ages of five and seven that play in the street and ramble in and out of each other's houses and backyards all day long. They get into little fights and figure out how to sort them out. They make messes and scrape their knees. It's amazing. But our culture has mostly shifted away from the time when moms would just shoo their kids out the door and call them in at dinner time. There's a lot more after-school activities and driving around. We also generally have smaller families, so we even have to schedule interactions with other kids. The result, says Jennifer Sr. in her book All Joy and No Fun, is a self-perpetuating cycle. If kids lead tightly scheduled lives from the time they're young, they seldom experience boredom, which means they don't really know how to tolerate boredom, which means they look to their parents to help them alleviate it. Raj Peterson has found this year to be a good opportunity to dig into more unstructured play. She's a surgeon and a mom of two boys, 15 and 11. You know, so many people are like designing their entire kid's day and we didn't grow up that way. I mean, we were like, we had all this free time to just explore or be creative and think of the things that we want to do just because those opportunities weren't there. Um, you know, there's, they have so many options for camps and things like that. Um, and what it's been nice these last couple summers with them being older where they can be home by themselves and we didn't have to force them into a camp. It's kind of nice for them to just have time. And I think, that was another thing with, with COVID, especially this summer. I was like, you know, their summer is a lot more like what our summers used to look like. They're out riding their bikes by themselves. And you'd let us know where they were, which like, that's a luxury like that our parents didn't have. So we knew they were always safe. And I'm like, why, why haven't we been doing this? (laughs) Yeah. We don't have to be their cruise director. We don't have to entertain them 24 seven. And it's actually detrimental to them not to experience boredom and it, the the independence that they get from that exactly. is huge. Yeah. Yeah. One of our like most annoying things that they could ever say is I'm bored, mm-hmm. which thankfully they don't say that often, but yeah, I mean, they've, they're, they've gotten really good at just, I mean, they'll, they'll just take our bin of Legos still and yeah. build crazy things or, um, or, you know, come up with something and then have us judge it at the end or whatever. But um, yeah, I think those are, those are important things. And I think that's, that's the heart that can be the challenging thing too, to do when you're working a lot yeah. is because you want to like do all this stuff with them, but also re- you realize that they need that time as well. They need that unstructured time. They've had all week in school and they don't always get that unstructured time where somebody's not telling them what to do or we're not planning out the whole day. That's important. You don't have to feel guilty when you pass the baton. This summer, I had an internal struggle on the shores of a beautiful lake. My dad had rented a couple of wave runners and the kids were so excited to take a ride. 
I wanted to be the fun mom, jetting around the lake, letting my kids drive crazy and throw me off the back like I used to do with my dad and my fun aunts when I was a kid. It's part of the image of who I want to be as a mom, one who doesn't say no to adventure and fun. But I'm also in my 40s and I have really bad motion sickness. I could go out and have a bit of fun and feel sick the rest of the day, or I could hang out on the beach while my kids went out with my dad and siblings. The year before, I chose the Wave Runner. This year, I thought, you know, my dad, brother, and sister can be the fun Wave Runner people, and I can be the fun mountain biking mom. So they went out and they had a great time, and I'm still a fun mom. I took them all out mountain biking the next day, and we had a blast. So we've already touched on this a little bit, but another great way to incorporate play into your family culture is Tactic 8, Establishing Fun Routines and Traditions. These can be big and small. For us, one of the sweetest playtimes is the easy tradition of snuggling with our two youngest kids, and sometimes some of the older ones too, in our bed on a Sunday morning. We play silly little games, listen to fun music, and toss them around a bit. I talked to Joy about some of her playful traditions. So I think, I feel like traditions are so important in our families that they, they can be super simple or they can be more involved. Like every Friday we have a pizza movie night and a lot of pa- families do that too. And it's, that's an easy one. And it's one that everyone can get behind. The kids take turns choosing the movie. We rotate. In fact, my, my husband and I uh, get a turn too. We rotate every week who gets to pick the movie. Every kid has a night that they get to stay up with mom and dad. So, you know, Sunday's this day, this kid's day, Tuesday's this kid's day. And then, and since we have five kids, that leaves Friday and Saturday night for my husband for our turns. So we get like a date night and they just stay up for like 15 minutes. That's, I mean, that's one of their favorite traditions that they get to have that special time with mom and dad. Cause a lot of times in those big families, I mean, it's just herd mentality, right? Like let's move, get to the next thing, everybody. (laughs) So they get to pick an activity and that's really, really fun. Lynette Shepard also schedules one-on-one time with her kids. For years and years, we've done like mom dates or daddy dates. So my husband does a date with a kid on one Saturday a month and I do a date with a different kid on one Saturday a month. And so we just like rotate whose turn it is and they get $25 for their date and they can choose how to spend it it's not like you go buy something with the $25. You have to use it for an activity. So they get to choose whether they go out to eat or maybe they want to see a movie or go golfing or bowling or, you know, we've done all sorts of things. But they really look forward to that. And we look forward to that too because it's fun to have that one-on-one time where it's just you and them and you have their undivided attention and you can talk about all the things that you've been wanting to talk about. Lynette hosts the podcast, How to Raise Grownups, which is full of wisdom about parenting teens and young adults. One of Celeste Davis's favorite traditions to make time for family fun is to come up with a family bucket list every season. We sit down as a family, every person in the family gets to do, pick two fun things to do that season. We write it down, we're very religious about it and we do it and we cross it off. And that is really fun because then when the kids come to me and are like, mom, can we go swimming? Mom, can we go ice skating? Mom, can we do this? I'm like, put it on the bucket list, put it on the bucket list. And they know that it's going to happen and then they feel valued. And then it's really a big success when everybody loves their activity and we're all really into it. And so that's been a big win for sure. And so I don't feel, and I also don't feel so guilty. Like I used to feel like the lamest mom when I was always like, no, no, not right now, not right now, no, no, no. You know, all that, like we can't go roller skating right now. We can't go have a mud party. I don't know. (laughs) Right. Yeah, the Um, no's really start weighing on everyone. They do. And so they know that they will get their say and we will do their family activity and it's on the calendar and it's going to happen. And that's been a big win for everybody. And also just that we, we do it. And otherwise, if we didn't have the bucket list, like we wouldn't, <laughs> you know, we would, it's just so easy to have all your free time taken up with movies and cause it's so easy. Yeah. So how do you manage expectations on the bucket list? I mean, I can picture my kids going, we're going to go to Disneyland and we're going to go, you know, Yeah. You know, I was afraid of that, but I don't know if it was just the first time we kind of like gave some examples and they just, they get so creative with stuff to do at home that they don't. And we did like a few times they were like, we want to go to classic fun center. We want to go ice skating. We want to do all these like kind of expensive things, whatever. And so we did, I think we did made a rule once that was like, at least one of your choices has to be at home. One time my daughter did ask to go camping. That was like the biggest one we've done but mostly it's like 
of, you know, a crazy game night where we like play 20 games or where we like dumped all of our building tools and Legos and magnet tiles and made a huge city for like two hours together. Or like, I don't know, they're so creative and they come up with stuff that just blows my mind every time that's really fun. So it's a fun creative outlet for all of us. One event that frequently makes it onto the bucket list is a March Madness style taste test. <laughs> it started with this YouTube channel that our family likes called Good Mythical Morning. And they did something in March of like two years ago called Munch Madness, like March Madness with the basketball brackets, but it's called Munch Madness. And it was all snacks. So there was like 32 snacks. <laughs> and they had a bracket of like sweet and salty and chips and candy. And um, anyway, then you like ate two of them. And then as a family, we would like vote on the best one to advance our bracket. And we all had our individual brackets and the family bracket. We had it up on a big whiteboard. And we got like really into it and like really competitive. And we would vote on it and try to guess. And then we'd have the winner. And so that was like so fun. We took like a bracket every night. So we had like eight snacks a night. I mean, it's a really head scratch where my kids love this so much. They have like candy every night. So then since then we've had like a madness <laughs> then we did gulp madness with just drinks so we did like dairy or soda or juice anyway brackets and that so lasts like a whole week and every night we'll do eight of them to whittle it down to one and then have the final four and we'll film it <laughs> yeah so since then we've done cereal madness we've done sweet madness with just desserts which of course they love and it was, it's just fun. Like they get so into it. We all have our individual brackets and our family brackets. And it's like a silly thing that we make up ourselves, but um, everybody really loves it. We just did pie madness. <laughs> Tactic nine is to adapt your play to different stages of motherhood. Once upon a time, I was a super fun mom. I wore out the knees and all my jeans from kneeling on the floor to play with my two little boys and chase them around. I made obstacle courses. I created marble runs with odds and ends all over the house. I knew the day of the week that our local appliance store threw out their big boxes and we'd go pillage them for epic forts. I made sensory bins, molded Play-Doh, crashed Hot Wheel cars, made treasure hunts, and played hide-and-seek like nobody's business. I made up games to get my kids to eat, games to help them pick up their toys, and games to help them get ready for bed. Then two kids turned into three and four and five. These last three catch occasional glimpses of that fun mom. But the truth is, that fun mom is usually helping a kid with homework or music lessons, driving them around, doing chores around the house, or prepping meals for seven. Should I feel guilty that I don't take as much time to play? No. For one thing, I'm tired. I have a much bigger workload with five children than with two. I have a lot less energy than that 28-year-old me, and my kids have much different needs. Should those three youngest kids be jealous of the fun mom the two oldest got? Heck no. They had much better playmates in their older siblings, who came up with much crazier, imaginative ways to play. I still play with my kids, but now it looks more like introducing them to great movies, playing games, leading hiking and biking adventures, and reading fun books together. I asked Maria about how play looks different for her with teenagers. Um, I learned from my husband's mom, they, they did something called midnight runs, which means when you have teenagers, it gets harder and harder to have play you know they, they it has to look very different and midnight runs is one of those things that can be an option that way so for example we'll I can come grab them at 11 30 at night and say okay we're going to run to the gas station and we're going to get a treat and it you know it's just one of those things that's like a quick hey I want to connect with you and I also really like that coke so let's let's make those two things happen at the same time so I feel like little things like that make a big difference Nancy Davis Coe, the host of the Midlife Mixtape podcast, has two young adult daughters. I asked her how they have fun together. Uh, would teasing my husband count as a oh, little... Yes. <laughs> we, so my husband is a very funny guy, and when he gets going, the three of us just sit around and listen to him, and we laugh, and we're like, what is he even talking about? Like, oh, here's a perfect example. One year... At Christmas time, not last year, the year before, we decided we watch all the Harry Potter movies all the way through again for the umpteenth time. We've all read the books and seen all the movies. And it's like my husband had never seen them before. He kept asking questions like, who is this guy? We're like, come on, buddy. You've, you're better than that. You've seen this before. So I don't know. I think he's kind of the straight man. And then we all just go to town. And that sounds like we're being really mean to my husband, but he enjoys it a lot. I think he yeah. loves just sitting there in the, with the girls on either side of him, you know? That's so, true. teasing dad, that's our hobby. Sometimes it's the little things. 
And finally, the last tactic is that sometimes you can say yes to play you don't enjoy, but figure out ways to make it more enjoyable. For the first example, let's go back to that classic playing on the floor scenario with Rebecca Wright, another mom who's writing and great ideas I really admire. I was actually really bad at playing with my kids. I really didn't enjoy it. I just kind of lost my imagination somewhere as a teenager and it never came back, you know, at least not in the form of being able to play. And, um, and then I did play therapy with one of my kids and I learned the easiest way to play with kids that I wish I had known from the beginning. And in play therapy, you are not supposed to come up with things as the adult. You're not supposed to create imaginative worlds. You're supposed to just follow your child's lead. And it's so easy when that's all you have to do. It takes all the pressure off. And so what it looks like is a lot of times I'll just set a timer for 10 minutes. I say, we're going to play for 10 minutes. And I sit down wherever they are and they pick up a toy and I pick up a toy and then they start moving their toy. And then I just copy. I just do what their toy is doing. And if I don't know what to do, I just ask them. I say, what, what's my dinosaur supposed to do? And they'll tell me. They don't need me to come up with anything. And that has been so cool. And in play therapy, the play therapist can see a lot of, of what's going on in the child's mind as this is happening. And they can analyze a lot and help you figure things out. But even just at home, without that knowledge that the therapist has, I can connect with my kids so well. And I can enjoy that time with them and not dread it and not hate it because I don't have to come up with anything. I simply just do what they're doing and they love it. They're so much happier after we do it. And we actually like for the next day, they'll even be happier. They'll be more connected to me. They'll be more responsive to me. And it's one of the best tools I've ever learned because every, every mom has a, the kids who are like, play with me, play with me, play with me. And it's so hard. But this way, it takes no imagination. It takes no knowledge. It takes nothing except for just being there, just being with them. And they tell you what to do. And it makes it so easy. You can find more of Rebecca's wisdom about motherhood and connecting with kids at her website, RebeccaBrownWright.com, and on her fabulous Instagram account at Pause and Connect. She's also created a brilliant back and forth journal you can use to connect with your kids. She's just got so many great ideas. One way that Joy makes playing with her kids more fun is by leveling the playing field. I love playing games, but I didn't love playing games until I could play for real. Like it's not fun for me Mm -hmm. to like, I mean, maybe here and there it's kind of cute, but I can't play for extended periods of time when I'm not actually playing. So the one thing that's helped me a lot, well, some of it is that my kids got older, but then also the, the handicap thing. Have you ever done that? Yeah. So you start with an extra five points or whatever the game is, or you give yourself like 20 extra cards or whatever it is, but then you can play for real and it's so much better. And sometimes a simple timer does the trick. Here's Rachel. There's plenty of times when my kids are super excited about something. They want me to play it with them and I don't really want to, but I say yes, because I love them. For example, They built a huge fort out in our backyard during quarantine and they wanted to have like a daily battle out there with us with Nerf guns and stuff. And honestly, every time I was like, this is so not my style of play and I don't really want to do this, but they were so excited about it. I love the creativity and I want to encourage the creativity of building the forts. And so I just told them I'll have one battle per day. And so they weren't asking me all day long, but they knew that they got one battle per day. And then I went all in and really battled and really got out there and did the war cry and everything for my one battle per day. But I wasn't going to be doing that all day long. And are they disappointed at the end? Yeah, sometimes they are. And that's okay that they can be disappointed. And I also think you don't need to then say like, I wish you would just be grateful for the time I just spent. You know, we are uncomfortable with their disappointment. So then we turn it into kind of like an argument instead of just saying, yeah, we had so much fun playing. I'm disappointed too that we have to stop. We'll play again tomorrow and move on. Oh man, I had so much fun putting this episode together and hearing all the great ideas of these brilliant moms. I hope we can all enter this holiday season with a playful spirit, equipped with a few more fun ideas to try, ready to lean into our strengths and really connect with our kids through play. These are the moments they're going to remember.
Thank you for listening to the How She Moms podcast. I'd love for you to join our community in the How She Moms Facebook group, where we share ideas, discuss upcoming episodes, and help each other solve problems. You can also follow me on Instagram at How She Moms for more tips and to see pictures of some of the ideas and moms I talk about here on the podcast. And you can also check out HowSheMoms.com for links to past episodes, my online courses, and to find out about upcoming events. Special thanks to my own mom, Susan Singley, for recording the theme music to my podcast. She played this song often as I was growing up, and to me, it's part of the soundtrack of motherhood.